Welcome to Urban Ebb, Southwest Gwinnett Magazine's podcast, bringing you stories from the heart of our local cities. Each episode, we dive deep into the lives of the dreamers and doers who make our communities vibrant and dynamic. From Peachtree Corners to Norcross, Berkeley Lake to Duluth, join us as we explore the diverse tapestry of voices that shape the essence of urban living. This is Urban Ebb, where work, play, and life converge. Hi, everyone. This is Rico Figliolini with our new podcast, Urban Ebb. I have a great guest today. So welcome uh, our chief city marshal here in the city of Peachtree Corners, Estrepo. Hey, Ed. hey Eddie. How are you? Oh, good morning, Rico. Thanks for having me today. No, I appreciate you joining us. We're doing this in the middle between Christmas and New Year, so just people get a little understanding when this was being recorded. And we're going to, before we get into the show, though, I do want to thank our sponsors for being part of supporting us, our journalism, our podcasts, and the magazines. And that's EV Remodeling, owned by Eli, Eli, who lives here in Peachtree Corners and has a great company doing a lot of remodeling here in the city of Peachtree Corners, as well as the external area. So evremodelinginc.com is where you can visit them, as well, Clear Wave Fiber that does a lot of internet services for businesses. There's over a thousand businesses, I believe, in Peachtree Corners that are serviced by them, if not more. They're a Southeast and national company handling internet IT services for a variety of companies. So check them out. Clearway Fiber is their company name. So now let's get right down to it. You've been hired as Chief City Marshal for the City of Peachtree Corners. You joined around, roughly around November 13th. So it's been you know, a little over six, seven weeks. Uh, How does it feel? I know you've been, just so people understand, you've been doing police work and for quite a bit of time, a few decades there. (laughs) Yeah, for 26 and a half years prior to coming here, I retired as a major over special operations uh, with the Gwinnett County Police Department. I I was looking at your resume. You have a, a variety of broad experience in in theft, in homicide, in in gangs, in drugs. So tell us a little bit about yourself, Eddie. Yeah, absolutely. So I am what you call one of those uh, northern transplants. <laughs> I was born in New Jersey, raised a little bit in the Yonkers, then we came back over and kind of bounced around between the Lincoln Tunnel and the George Washington Bridge all along that whole side of town, whether it was West New York, Fairview, New Palisades Park, Ridgefield, that whole area. Uh, talk about traffic. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And so I was kind of the last holdout. Majority of my family had moved down to Georgia years, and I decided to go further north. So I ended up going up to Boston oh, wow. for a couple of years. And beautiful city, great. However, during that time, it was going to be difficult to get into law enforcement without prior experience or knowing people up there. It was just the way it is in Boston. And so... I remember my brother giving me a call and saying, hey, it looks like they're doing a lot of hiring out here in Georgia. You may want to come down here and uh, you may have an opportunity to get on law enforcement down here. So I did. I came down. I applied with several. And uh, when it at that time seemed to be the right fit, kind of what I was looking for, got hired on with them. And six and a half years later, here I am. Wow. So the city interviewed quite a few people. And when they decided to do the city marshal system, there was a lot of debate about what that would entail, you know, what responsibilities you would have and stuff, and and that the officers that are being hired would be post-certified. So for people that don't know, they would be there. Obviously, you're from Gwinnett Police, so you've had a background in police services, but even the other two marshals are post-certified. That means that they've been certified to be police officers. In effect, you are police officers just with a different agenda, if you will, or guideline there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we have all the same rights. You know, every police officer, for you to be certified in the state of Georgia, has to have at least a minimum 10-week mandate. However, all of us went through 26 weeks initially with uh, the Gwinnett County Police Department. They tend to do almost double, almost triple the amount of training than other agencies, I guess you could say. At least the metro agencies tend to run their own academies and tend to do more advanced courses and things of that nature. So they came with, you know, 26 weeks entering. And then of course, all the training that you get along the way throughout the years, when you branch off into, you know, specialized units and things of that nature, you obviously get into a more specific category of training. So 
of the experience that you have. So give me a rundown, like a bullet list of the type of experience you have. Yeah, absolutely. So when I started through the academy, you graduate, you go through your uh, field training, and that could take anywhere from two to three months. And you're riding with a more experienced officer, and they're kind of showing you the ropes and get what you've learned in the academy. And then, you know, kind of the practical side of what how things work on the road. So, you know, you get through that. I think I tend to be, well, at least I was told that I caught on very quickly because within about a year or so, I became an FTO just because of how active I was uh, being, you know, proactive out there, you know, stopping cars, going out on suspicious people, making arrests, doing all those things. Mm-hmm. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of uh, bilingual officers. You know, I think it was me and probably two or three other. <laughs> and we were abused a whole lot, obviously, because there's a big uh, Latino population here in uh, Gwinnett, even back then, obviously, you know, yeah. this year. Yeah. But, you know, we would get called upon to do interviews and talk, talk to witnesses and suspects. And I got to really get to know a lot of the guys in major felony and robbery and gangs. And I guess they took a liking to me. And so when those positions became available, I had built those relationships, kind of showed my fortitude for for, <laughs> for going after criminals. And so I was fortunate that pretty pretty early on, I was selected to go to the gang unit. And then from there, robbery, homicide, and then kind of everything kind of went through there. There's kind of like a, a progression, you say, as you go through your career, you get promoted. Sometimes you get to stay. Sometimes they want you to go back to the road and get that supervisor experience on the road. And then, you know, when positions open up back in those specialized units, because you have that experience, they call you back. And so you can see kind of through my bio that, you know, I would go be there for a short period of time in uniform and then go back and be selected to a specialized unit. And that was kind of my career path. I would say I was that go-to guy when there was flare-ups with serious crime issues. I was the guy that they would come to to try to to get the, to resolve those things. And so I kind of, uh, I prided myself in it, grabbed it and surrounded myself with a good group of people. And, you know, when, when after the criminal is kind of, kind of why the whole reason we became police officers, right? Well, yeah. It takes a certain type of person to do that and, and consistently and, and well, certainly my, my respect goes out to you and, and your team. Uh, Latina. Well, what, what specific metabolism by heritage? Yeah. Yeah. So both my parents are from Columbia, South America. Okay. And you're, are you, so you're first generation American or were you? Yeah, yeah I was born stateside. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Cool. You're joined by two other marshals, two other officers. Same typical background? Or do you, are no, you so everybody's had a little bit different. I mean, let's, let, we could start off with our deputy chief, Johnny Bing. Johnny Bing did 17 years with Gwinnett County. He did his post instructor, he was in detectives. So he has a lot of that investigative experience and he also has that, you know, post instructor training, which is very important, especially for us, since, you know, all the training and everything we go through, we have to have someone in the bullpen that's able to do all that, you know, because there's requirements when we take our training and how that has to be. And that's all monitored and oversaw by post. And so to have him on the team is, is really, really good. A lot of his experience was in, the realm of special victims, so elderly, child abuse, all those kind of not so great things. <laughs> I I helped out, but I never, I kind of stayed away from that side of the house when it came to it. It's just, uh, I don't know, he did, he did a great job at it. And so he brings that level of experience. Henry Mesa did about seven, eight years. He started like me when he was 21, I believe. And he has a lot of background when it comes to community-oriented policing, the community engagement. He also spent a fair amount of time both at the precinct and in detectives doing a multitude of property crimes and persons crimes. So a lot of us have a lot of investigative experience, which, you know, with us just being three of us, it's very important that that we have that skill set. Yeah, no, for sure. Especially with the technology now that you guys are going to be working with or that you've actually been working with. Yeah, absolutely. That was one of the one of the reasons that was uh, here that having uh, the opportunity and getting the offer here in the city was just that, you know, when I was here as the major for two and a half years, that was one of the big things that I worked with Brian and everyone else here at the staff was really promoting, you know, the flock and, you know, all the other technologies we've had and integrating them and really creating that ecosystem to where, you know, we have these tools that not only prevent, but in the event that a crime does have to be able to efficiently 
develop leads and right. you know, that uh, get to catching the criminal and stopping the repetitious crime. I've heard from Brian that uh, we've discussed it a few times on and off the podcast that you all have been drawn into things sometimes where Gwinnett police might have had an incident happen saying we want you guys to be uh, on the lookout for a particular car might have a bullet hole in its windshield you know mm -hmm. can you guys keep an eye out and you guys have been tracking the real time tracking in some cases yeah so absolutely. Can, you, can, can you tell me a little bit about how that helps the yeah absolutely work? i mean you know we have over 50 odd license plate readers in the city and those were strategically placed in areas where we thought you know criminals would come in and out of the city. And so when there's an incident, we're able to go back to those, look in those areas. If we have some nearby surveillance or witnesses that would be able to say, hey, this is what the car would look like, or this is what we believe, match it up. And then, you know, going back and looking at there and starting there with getting a vehicle, right? And then, yeah. you know, you can hot list those vehicles. And that means, you know, anytime that vehicle's moving, we would get alerts. And then that's helpful for us to be, you know, pretty strategic and purposeful when we want to stop that vehicle, who's in it and kind of just continue the investigation there. Correct. So a lot of really good things there. So there's that portion of it. And then there's just other, you know, different softwares and databases that we're able to access that help us develop uh, leads. You know, it's very hard to stay off the grid nowadays. You know, everybody. Yeah. One way or another, unless you just pay straight cash, you know, every every day, you know, you could go down, drive down the road and you're, you know, you can get on your own ring camera, your neighbor's ring camera, whatever you right. be, right? I mean, it's it's very hard today to be off the grid, I guess you could say. In, think in the if, Metro Atlanta area. I think if you're out in Calhoun, Georgia or somewhere, it might be a little easier, but even there, I mean Yeah, no, they're starting to put up license plate readers. I mean, when you really yeah. look at it. I mean, we're all struggling when it comes to manpower, especially the bigger agencies. And so, you know, it's one of those equalizers, right? The technology, you know, yeah. uh, cameras don't get burnt out. They don't call in sick, you know, they're yeah. always up and running. They don't complain. So yeah, yeah. The more that you can put those things out, money eyes out there at all hours of the night. And then, you know, when something does happen, really do have something you would tap into and really move forward with generating. a very So how challenging is it as, I know, for example, the form has added cameras. The form has had some issues a little bit with Lululemon. You know, it's been a national thing just because of the brand name. Yeah. The robbery at the uh, jewelry the store there a few months ago, I think it was. So there's more cameras being added. There's more uh, technology being added. So how does that how, how do you filter that out? Because at some point, there's just a lot that yeah, so to work through. I'm sure you're familiar, but, you know, one of the big things, you know, there are certain priorities that I think we want to move forward and pretty aggressively, you know, with starting up the marshal's office. And, you know, we have the Connect Peace Street Corners program, right? And so right. where, you know, we're really urging both, you know, the business community majority for now and then residential at a minimum to register their cameras with us, right? The registering is, hey, I'm just going to let you know that I have a camera here. If something happens, here's my information. You come knock on my door and I'll provide it. And then where we say integration is they're providing, you know, those exterior forward facing cameras on them to us for us to see and use those in our crime preventative. And as far as you utilize us to develop leads, right? And so those are very big. That's one thing that, you know, us coming on that we're going to work really closely with, you know, the businesses, apartment complexes, hotels, extended stays, mm -hmm. especially those areas where, you know, we have those flare ups where, you know, we just have more calls for service and repetitive things happen. So we want to kind of stay ahead of that. And so that's where I think the the Connect Peachtree Corners program is going to be. So, there. And I've noticed through conversations with, uh, Brian Johnson and, and some other people with the city and even some other local business people, you know, so you, like you mentioned, some of the hotels, long stay hotels where, you know, where crime t tends to happen. There may be some apartment complexes where there's more crime than other places. They are beginning to add cameras to those locations. So more and more with these, with the cameras being added, not just license plate readers, but facial recognition to some degree, right? Although yeah. the data is not kept, right? Uh, but there is a journey towards safety 
and to towards solving crime. So with where you know when you're dealing, when you were you know you were originally when a police officer, now you're a city marshal. There's very there's very different way that you have to operate. Do you still solve crimes? Do you still, or are you part of the team that solves the crime with Gwinnett Police? For I think we're, I think we're a complementary, right? You know, necessarily you have to understand. You know, Gwinnett is a very big agency, right? And so, yeah. that may be a priority for us, and them may differ, right? Because they're worrying about the whole county, right? As far as the city, you know, let's just say, you know, three entering autos in a subdivision overnight may not be you know, a big priority for the Gwinnett County Police Department if they've been dealing with a robbery and a shooting and whatnot. Sure. So for us, that is a big priority, right? So today, I just literally got a text message from business owner of one of the apartment complexes where there was someone trying to break into the mailboxes. And that was something that we helped out and we identified a suspect. And so literally before we got on podcast here, I got that, sent it to my marshals, and the first thing there he's going to go do is head over there, get the video, talk, go through all those things, start pulling the surveillance, start looking at the flock cameras to see if we can't develop a suspect, right? Because you know if we don't stop them, they're going to continue to do it, right? In fact, this, in fact, there was one that was just happened before a few weeks ago, I guess. Yes, that's correct. Yes, yeah. So it's just it's just that time of year, you know, you have people's taxes, things coming in, gifts, packages. Yeah. It just you you know this is you know tis the season I guess you could say for yeah. for those for those bad actors so yes. yeah the quicker we're able to identify pers- that person and put them under arrest then we kind of stop their their crime spree right and so yeah. that may not necessarily be a big priority for you know the Gwinnett County Police Department because they have other things but mm-hmm. for us we're able to be more calculated more purposeful and you know is a priority for the city do do you with the city with companies like Flock uh, that does provide the cameras or like Fusis that does the crime center in the, in the cloud. Yeah. Um, do you all also participate or will you, or do you foresee yourselves participating in creating solutions to some of the crimes that happen? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm in the process of finishing up my dissertation on policing technologies. And so I don't want to take anything more on bigger, but my plan or my tentative plan is to try to put something together. Now you have a national real-time crime center association, but I wanted to kind of do it on a more Metro Atlanta because we all look, you know, one of the biggest kind of tragic events that really highlighted not sharing information would have been obviously September 11th, right? There was just red flags that were up and things that weren't being shared. And so, you know, we'd be foolish not to look at that in this realm where we have all this technology and one, you know, we could have some criminals, you know, committing some violent crimes to cab and then an investigator there knowing that they're creeping into Gwinnett or Peachtree Corners, you know, while they're trying to develop their case, why not have an experienced set of people stop the car here, find out what they're doing, see if there's anything that works into their way into the car, develop evidence and take them out before something else happens, right? So the old school way was, I'm going to protect the integrity of my case. I'm not going to tell anybody. And now you have violent people running around and you want to kind of keep your fingers crossed, hoping hopefully I'll be able to build my case and take them out before something happens or utilize this technology to the benefit of where you're bringing in other law enforcement professionals to help you stop that as soon as you can. Because we could build our case. If we stop a car and we find some Mm -hmm. stolen property, they go from there. But then there's all the other things that you can do to place them at the scenes of other crimes. You know, there's different ways that you can approach cases. And, you know, that especially those violent ones, right? You want to be able to try, you want to build a case, but you also want to take them out as soon as you can, because the the next thing could be very tragic, right? Uh, And, you know, not being in police work, I didn't even think about that. I think I'm fairly knowledgeable in things. I don't know everything, obviously. That's why I love doing these podcasts. I get to learn a lot more. I see the other perspective of of things. But like anyone else, I mean, I didn't realize that. You know, you think people assume you arrest someone, they get out on bail usually, and you're working a case on it, but that doesn't stop them, right? Because it's a job to them, okay. right? They Essentially, they have to make a living. They're going to commit other crimes, because they're doing a risk reward type setup, you know, what's my risk? What's my reward? If they're smart. If they're not, if they're, you know, have other issues, then that's different. But so they continue on and you have to. So how is that? You know, because I know working between agencies like Atlanta 
police, maybe Fulton County Police or Sandy Springs, which borders us in a little part of what we do, yeah. Roswell. How is that in Johns Creek? That's another, you know. Yeah, in, a, in an ideal scenario, we would all be kind of on the same platform, right? And I think, you know, Fuses is doing a really good job at getting a lot of the different cities and counties on the same board. I will tell you there was a grant that was provided by UASI and uh, the NR, which they're part of kind of the Atlanta regional. And so where they were giving, you know, either the first year or first two years of fuses to all the metro counties, right? Because in the event of a, you know, a large natural disaster or a man-made incident or whatever it may be the case, right. for them to all operate together on the same radio channel, have the same training, a lot of the same equipment. Right. And so they saw that, you know, that was vital. You know, there was a lot of blind spots. If everybody has different, you know, separate systems, then we're not seeing, you know, the criminals don't respect those lines. And so yeah. we shouldn't either. <laughs> we should be one step ahead of them. And I so, so it's, it's vitally important for us to be all on that same sheet of music. And, you know, everybody's going to have different likes of certain equipment, certain technologies. But if the big basis that, you know, we're working off of is, you know, when a criminal comes out of Atlanta or South Atlanta and comes up to Peachtree Corners, if let's say Dunwoody or Dorville knows that they're entering auto suspect, well, they could hot list that vehicle for us to see, to be able to say, hey, there's a, it's three o'clock in the morning and a vehicle that's known to be tied to entering autos is coming into the city. Well, they're probably not. There's not a lot of things open at three o'clock in the morning in the city. So that would probably be a good traffic stop, a good conversation to find out who's in that car, what they're doing. They may find some tools, possession, you know, tools to commit burglary or entering autos. And, you know, we can kind of go from there. You can start with loitering and prowling and get into the car. They may have warrants. There might be stolen cars. So it's just a big snowball effect. But yeah. we would never know that if we're not sharing that information. Right. So is it you know, in an urban environment, this this is what Urban Ebb is about, talking yeah. about small cities, really, not the larger cities, but small cities like ours, 40,000 40, to 100,000 people. You know, police police work is one thing, martial work, because you're only allowed to do certain things because of the nature of, of what the martial system is. Now, they may that may change over the next decade, who knows, as the city grows, as things happen. But do you find that the uh, the parameters that you have to work in is that is that a good thing? Um, no, I think so. Right? I think it allows us. So, un, I guess you could say, unfortunately, or fortunate, whichever way you want to look at it, when a county contractually has to respond to all the nine one one calls, right? And you know that could be just a thing where call after call after call comes in. So all they're being is reactive, right? Where we as the marshals we get to pick and choose what a priority or what we want to dig our teeth into, right? So if it's an entering auto issue, if it's a quality of life issue, if it's, you know, we've had a spree of violent crimes here, we could, all three of us could literally go, all right, for the next week or so, this is what we're concentrating on our efforts on, right? And we can develop those leads. Once we develop a suspect, we can, you know, give Gwinnett a call and say, hey, look, this is going good. We're probably going to need some more assets, some more people, but this is what we've gotten up to this point. And then work the rest of it on through and taking out the bad actors. So with police work, it's uh, interesting. I mean, in what I do, sometimes I get to go to different trade shows. I do marketing for different companies. I've been to the international trade show and to the toy and amusement industry show it's kind of interesting to be able to go to some of those i have not yet been to the consumer electronics show but i am sure that there is a trade show for security police city work there's an industry out there fuses is part of that so what are the technologies are you seeing that an urban center like ours could be using yeah absolutely so one of the two things that we're really moving forward with is obviously the use of drones, that's going to be very big here in the city, both on the law enforcement side, but also on the civilian side, right? With the city being so well known for its being, you know, a well-renowned smart city with all the different technologies that they have here, we're going to carry that on on the drone level, both on the civilian business industry side, but also on the law enforcement side. And part of that, as well as us 
uh, moving forward with having, I guess, not a real time crime center, because I think a lot of people think like it's going to be monitored all the time, but we will have and we'll be in the process of we're bidding now, but to build out a center where all the different camera feeds will go into a room. Eventually, we would like to where we would get to no line of sight with the drones, right? Like Brookhaven, our neighboring jurisdiction down here, they're flying drones off the rooftops of uh, buildings and responding to calls, right? Giving you that really good situational awareness. And so they're right down the road. I actually talked to Brian yesterday and uh, we're going out to a big drone conference. It's kind of big international in April. All of us are going to go out there to see, but then we're also, we've cut, carved out a day where we're going to meet with Chula Vista Police Department, and they're kind of the big innovators in the drone space and law enforcement. So okay. hopefully we'll be able to spend half a day or a day out there and see from where they went conceptually to where they're known, where, you know, they get visitors from all around the world that want to model the program that they got going on over there. So I'm a firm believer there's no... Uh, sense to reinvent the wheel if there's somebody that's done it out there time tested then sure. probably to, you know you not to commit a lot of errors you're better off going to seeing you know who's who's done it who's done it well and, and kind of borrow things from them right that makes sense sure um, with ai being part of what's out there now we're going to be we're actually through the magazine through the publication and in the podcast we're going to be talking more about ai in business yeah. and how ai works with how different companies in the city of Pastry Corners, for example, are using AI, you know, whether it's just to create a bot to do a simple thing, or they're using it to do sales, or maybe they're creating their own original use of, of that. Do you see um, city police work using AI at some the point? AI portion for sure. I think, you know, a lot of the things and the cameras we move forward with, we want them to either have AI built into it, or if there be... AI being able somewhere where that feed is being channeled to incorporate AI. And I'll give you an example. Let's say we're having some overnight burglaries of gas stations, because that happens, or of some of the supermercados that are in the city and things of that nature. And I say that because it's happened, right? Mm -hmm. But we could set up an AI on those cameras between, you know, let's say midnight to 530 in the morning, right? And if a vehicle, a person, or anybody goes into that geofence that's on the AI camera, mm-hmm. we would get an immediate alert, right? And that's the biggest thing. You know, a lot of the problems that you have with in-progress crimes is the alarm goes off, it goes to the call center, the call center holds on to it, then it goes over to trying to figure out what police department, who they need to call. And that's several minutes past, they're already in, out, on their way, unless the officer just happens to be, you know driving by and sees it and is right on top of it. So that is huge in my, when we're able to do these geofences and also like, let's say town center, right? If we have an AI component, you know, I think you may have learned that we've had some issues with, you know, people loitering and hanging out on the top deck and doing some things that they shouldn't be doing, but you could set up a geofence once you can do it with cars or people and then time. So if, you know, there's going to be times where people are just going to go to have dinner at one of the restaurants. They're getting together and they're going, but you set it up for 10 minutes, 10 people or more, they start going to that space and you go probably brewing something bad's about to happen and then be able to get that live feed. That's definitely one thing. And then obviously there's another technology where you can talk through the cameras. Hey, this is such and such with the marshal's office. I don't know what you're up to, but we're heading that way. And if you're had bad intentions, it's probably best you leave now. And then you'd be surprised how many people get into their car and right. <laughs> we're watching us. It's time to go, right? Uh, so all those different things, right? So AI is is a tremendous tool. I mean, it's just, you know, how much time does one have? Problems one wants to tackle. Those are the things. I mean, that's 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 the great thing of all these different crime fighting technologies. Do you find, Eddie, that when you go, I don't know if you're like me a little bit, when I go to different cities based on my interest on things will pique my interest. So, I mean, when you go to other cities and visit other places, do you notice what other police force are driving, how they're handling situations? I'm sure you're you're seeing how other security, uh, police security forces yeah. handle situations. Is yeah. that helpful? I mean, do you look at that stuff? Oh, no, most definitely. I mean, I think, you know, 
with part of my dissertation and me just being a life learner and then just wanting to learn more about technologies and, and things of that nature, I have gone around to numerous cities. I mean, even in the local area, I've been to Duluth. Duluth has a very impressive RTCC center there that they monitor. Been to Atlanta, Cobb, Orlando. I've been everywhere just because I want to kind of get a good feel on what the latest and greatest stuff is out there and what's working, right? Again, I go back to time test and improve. You know, unfortunately, some people in law enforcement, you know, the shiniest object comes up and they go, oh, this is the greatest thing we're going to go with. And they commit to something and then it doesn't turn out to be as great as it was, right? To where you could look at a neighboring large agency that goes, you know what, they've been doing it right. They have a lot of cameras. They've been able to solve a lot of serious crime, improve quality of life for their residents and visitors. Maybe this is the direction we want to go, or at least give it some really strong consideration, I guess you could say. Are there things that we haven't covered that you'd like to mention that, uh, that you know, should... it's exciting. I mean, you know, to me, you know, the opportunity to come here and really showcase the technology, uh, you know, I say this to Brian, I say this to everybody, you know, we want to serve as the ambassadors for technology because we're small, we're able to be agile and nimble, right? We don't have to go through all these huge processes that, you know, a big county government has to go through to procure certain things, right? right. So, I mean, we've, you know, we have, I would gather to say probably the most amount of less lethal options that you could have here in the city between the bola wraps, between, you know, the burn up, pepper ball, OC, kinetic ball things. I mean, oh, right, right, right. name it. Just, we just, we want to explore. We have actually our training set for the Taser 10s, which just are literally coming out. Um, and what are those? So, so Taser 10, so for Tasers, it's basically, you know, the electronic weapons that, you know, you would shoot into someone that has probes that would lock up their neurological system, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So for the longest time, it's always been kind of two probes. But with that, if you're running after somebody, you know, they're moving around, the probes don't always hit. Right. Well, what Taser has done is they've kind of through their progression, now they have a Taser 10. And so the Taser 10 is just what the name says. There's 10 probes. And so if I'm running after someone, I could shoot the first probe. You have to at least have two good contact probes. So if for some reason, I'm scaling a the fence. They're running. They zig. I'm zagging at the time, whatever PP. Mm -hmm. I'm going to shoot enough times until I get a good okay. connection. And then they go down. And then I'm able to affect the arrest. So wow. just those type of things. But no, there's just so much stuff that's out here. And, you know, we've already hosted other agencies coming over here that have been wanting to try these things out. So that's always a big thing, right? For them to come to us and be like, hey, can you host this? And yeah, we'd love to have you come. This is, you know, us grab the data, kind of put it out there for people, show them, you know, the, the, the good or the bad. And if it doesn't work out, then we scrap it and we move on and we look for other stuff. But if it's good, we keep it in our arsenal and, and, and deploy it and, you know, make it safe on us, the people that we're interacting with and all those things, so. Yeah, well, that's cool. And I would imagine there are companies constantly coming out here, probably pitching, showing the technology. Even. Yeah, no, actually, I have a really good relationship with Chris from Fusis. And so, you know, you know, he comes across, he partners with a lot of great agencies. And so, you know, that's kind of the byproduct of, you know, them being in the city and me having good relationships with them when they say, hey, you know, we just met with this company, you may want to give them, a, you know, a try, right? And that's happened on multiple occasions throughout my time as the major and now as the chief marshal here in the city. So do, do you see, do you see in a city like ours or even, you know, I mean, it's happening all over the place. The, the increase of retail robbery. I think they, there was one stat that said 30% of robberies, retail robbery. I don't know if there's any big solution. So you touched on something that, you know, sometimes can be taboo, but which was facial recognition, right? And so I will say you're, we're starting to see the pendulum swing the other way. And I say that in when you have a state like New York, where you're from, and where I was, you know, a small portion of my life earlier on, is these retail stores just can't absorb these losses. And so there is a big chain supermarket store up there that has literally put facial recognition in their stores. So when they have an individual that they've criminally trespassed or they've identified as a person, that person comes back into any of their supermarkets where they've been trespassed. An alert goes off, staff comes over there, they call the police. 
there has to be consequences. If there's not consequences, mm -hmm. this is why we're seeing the problem that we're seeing, right? And so as long as you have those things in place, and I say like, who would have thought today that we would be okay with going through a checkpoint and taking our shoes off, our belts, our watches and all that other stuff. But that's what needed to happen, prevent something, right? So we're able to, or at least we're, we decide, hey, you know what? I'm willing to do that because there's a greater cause or our safety, right? And yeah. so kind of the same thing here with facial recognition. And I try to tell people facial recognition, it's one of those things that, how do I explain this? No police officer or anybody that would get an alert on facial recognition is going to act on that information alone. It's just a small portion of a puzzle. Like, let's say I ran facial recognition and I got, you know, hit back and it said it's 98%. This is the person. Mm -hmm. I would never go get a warrant based on a computer telling me that they think that's the person. I'm still going to do all my due diligence and doing all the things that my investigation would be. My first priority is, okay, if they're saying that person, where was that person? Did that Was that person, could they have been in the state? Could they have been in the city? Mm -hmm. Is there a car tied to them? Where they working that day? Am I going to go check to see if they were at work at that day? You know, all those things, I'm either going to dispel that or I'm going to prove that they were and you move on. But I think people think that, you know, this thing generates potential individual and that we're just going to go, all right, put them on the list. Let's get a warrant. Let's get them locked up. That does not happen. And I think that's where I think a lot of people, you know, with facial recognition have been. But if you look at airports if you look at border patrol they've been using facial recognition oh yeah oh that you go to another country you know damn well you're going through there and they're going to yeah. be, you know face recognition that's that's how those people stay I mean, those very they, violent countries for sure in europe and europe and interpol definitely yeah. use yeah, that absolutely. because of terrorist activity and absolutely. we're not even talking about profiling anymore profiling is the thing of the past to something Correct. you know it's so, but you're you're correct. I've seen and heard the same thing. You know, it's a tool of one of many things being used. So, but I'm glad that our, you know, I'm glad the city's working towards that. I mean, we're we are we promote ourselves as a smart city with lots of technology. So this this makes sense for us to be doing that. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking with Eddie Restrepa, Chief Marshal for the City of Peachtree Corners. So I appreciate you being with us. If, if anyone out there listening has questions, Eddie can be reached through the city's website. Certainly they can reach. Is there a, a place, particular email or something you want to give out? Yeah. Or? So if they'll just uh, do the marshal's office, I don't have it in front of me, but if they just go to the city of Peachtree Corners and um, they'll go to the marshal's office, that'll take them to two of our vehicles. If they see them out and about, there's the QR code they can scan and that'll oh, take really? them directly to our website. When we're out and about, we'll have the, Peace Tree, Connect Peace Tree Corners, banners readily available, all those things. Again, we really want to heavily promote that. You know, it's one of those things where, you know, help those that are helping you, right? We as the marshals and the police, the more eyes we could have out there. And it's just simple, right? You, you know, if you have a camera that you're willing to share with us, mm -hmm. and hopefully that could be the difference between us solving and preventing crime. I mean, why wouldn't you want to be involved? I think, you know, anybody with a good heart and, you know, wants mm -hmm. good things for their community would want to be able to provide those things to the crime fighters so we can, you know, keep you as safe as possible. I mean, it's interesting. The ring camera, I have that too. And if you're part of that community, you get dinged every once in a while about besides lost pets and pets. It's it's a bit of like, did you see these guys? They've been like in my driveway checking the door, the locks on my doors or Absolutely. the door handles. So things are happening out there. Yeah, uh, and, you know, as we get the website and we get a little bit more active on social media, which you'll see that I'm working with Lewis, our communications director, to kind of really put together what we've been doing behind the scenes and moving that forward, we'll be able to be putting more of that information out through that. So, you know, when we have those instances where, like you said, a series of entering autos, you know, we could put that to the community. Hey, can you help us identify these people? Or, hey, we've had a spree in this area, you know, watch lock up your valuables, be a little bit more vigilant in those areas, you know, contact any suspicious activity, all those good things. Cool. Well, thank you, Eddie. I appreciate you being on. Hang in there with me for a minute as we sign off. Appreciate everyone listening to this new podcast, Urban App, with our guest here, Eddie Restrepo, Chief Marshal at City of Peachtree Corners. Any questions, put it in the comments below, whether you're watching on YouTube or on Facebook. We'd love to hear from you. Thank you all. Thank you.
thank you for joining us on another episode of Urban Ebb. If you enjoyed today's conversation and want to stay connected with the heartbeat of our local cities, be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. If you have a story to share or know someone who does, we'd love to hear from you. The pulse of Peachtree Corners, Norcross, Berkeley Lake, and Duluth beats through the dreams, actions, and stories of some great individuals we feature. Until next time, this was Urban Ebb, your gateway to the heart of urban living. Thank you.